I think we've got to be patient, but at the same time, I do feel very good about uh, working with the new administration to move forward. And I'm, I'm excited. I think that President Ghani has embraced the international community, and he's embraced the Afghan security forces. They're excited as well. They're psyche. They're, they're, uh, uh, they know that they have a president now that is a commander-in-chief. He's gone out and visited hospitals. He's gone out and visited some of their training. Uh, he's talked about many of the issues they've had for many years about pay and about rotation plans, you name it. I was with him this week when we had an MOI and an MOD conference, a joint conference, and both the CEO Abdullah and the President talked. It was the first time the President had an opportunity to talk to all the senior leadership. I think they're looking forward to what is in the future. I think we just have to stay uh, invested here, the international community, and uh, I look forward to continuing to work with the senior leadership here. So I'm excited about the future. Afghanistan's new leader, President Ghani, appears to be a strong supporter of ISAF and the coalition. What are his expectations of ISAF? We've sat down quite a bit on the future of Afghanistan. Believe me, he's looking at some very 50-meter targets that he has to work on, and he's looking long-term as well. What I've talked to him about is we, we have to get out of the Afghan security forces fighting year to year to year. We have to give them some systems that they can sustain in the programming and the budgeting world and get a campaign plan, five-year, ten-year. And they're working through this piece. And he's really gathered the right uh, folks, both in MOI and MOD, with the intellectual capacity to build a campaign plan for him. We're not going to do that for him. We'll help and advise. But uh, the Afghans will write this. So that's very good. They're looking at a national threat assessment, a national security policy, a national security strategy. And that's all moving, so I, I think that's going to be very good. And he will be dependent upon ISAF to continue to help uh, build in the areas that the Afghan security forces continue to need help in. That's in aviation, that's in logistics, that's in the intel world, and we're committed to doing that. What about the Afghans themselves? Do they have comprehension that the footprint will be much smaller? They know that we're going down to reduced levels. Now, the numbers we're going to have here in country, both for the U.S. and for the international community, much lower than we were. And that's evidenced by the number of cops and fobs out there that we have that we don't have anymore, that we've turned back over to the Afghans where we've closed. So I, I think the sense out there is uh, they know we're going to have a much smaller force, but just having the international community support uh, not only in the train, advise, and assist, but also with the investment, which is what they really need here, uh, in donor countries, and that will continue to provide them support. I think the other thing, loud and clear, that I get from the people on the signing of the BSA and the, uh, and the SOFA is that there's a strong message to the Taliban and to the insurgents, and that is that, hey, look, the international community is here. You can't continue to say that this is not a sovereign country, you know, and, you, and what you're doing now is you're fighting your own people, and why are you doing this? And President Ghani has put that message out. Remember, 90% of the uh, civilian casualties here, over 90 percent, 94, 95 percent, are caused by insurgents and the Taliban. They're killing their own women and children. And so that message out there uh, is absolutely got to resonate. And the people have told me that there's no reason for the Taliban to fight. Uh, President Ghani mentioned this at uh, his inauguration. He's reached out. He'll continue to reach out. But he understands also that uh, they can't continue to fight. They, if they want to be part of the process here in the future of Afghanistan, then they got to they got to lay down their arms. Are you getting what you're going to need from NATO? Well, we're still working through that. Now, Operation Enduring Freedom was really a U.S.-only uh, US piece of it. ISAF is really the international community piece of it. You know, we've had over 50 countries that have been tied into ISAF over the years. Again, a huge coalition of support. Uh, never been seen before that you've had that many countries staying together over conflict. As we work toward resolute support, uh, which should start on about the 1st of January, there's a certain amount of NATO forces that we need. We continue to work through that. Uh, we have some informal bids. We're working to get those formal, which means we get the right people with the right skill sets trained in Afghanistan by the right time. A little bit slower than I had hoped, and part of that really is because of the delayed uh, signing of the BSA and the SOFA. Many countries were waiting to get that signed before they absolutely committed to go forward. But on resolute support, we're really going to focus on train, advise, and assist at the ministry levels, at the MOI and the MOD and then at the core level, and then some of the senior levels in the police. So that's really different from where you've seen it before, where it was when I was here in 2010, 2011, when we were with every corps, we were with the brigades, we were out patrolling every single day. We're not going to do that. We're not patrolling with the Afghans. They've taken on the lead for security here the last two fighting seasons. This is still a dangerous place, though, right? Yeah. Many soldiers seem to think that the fighting season is almost continuous these days. How are you dealing with that threat? 
Well, Afghanistan will remain a, a dangerous place, I think, uh, into 2015, 2016. I think the whole world continues to be a much more complex and a dangerous place. But I do think that the 352,000 Afghan security forces and the 30,000 Afghan local police, they have what it takes to defeat this insurgency here. Anywhere they get committed, the enemy can't hold that train. So you'll see a lot of uh, exaggerated reporting, beheadings, hundreds of houses being burned, and those are happening potentially in very remote areas and get those reports up. But as we get out there and see that, you know, that's not the case. And it's a, it's a cry from governors or district governors for more resources. But what it does actually is it erodes the confidence that the people have in the Afghan security forces. And so we're really trying to work with them on quit the exaggerating reporting. We can't expend resources to go out there and then find out, you know, nothing's happening out there. That's where the Taliban can do that, though. They go to these remote areas. They can take over a checkpoint. But then when the Afghan security forces get that and they go back and they surge on this, they, they, they take over the terrain. So there's nowhere that the Taliban have been able to hold terrain. The objectives they set for the fighting season, they haven't been able to do that. In fact, what we get is that the leadership of the Taliban is fighting each other. And as you know, they leave and they go back over into Pakistan. They go in sanctuary. And so the Taliban, the, the normal Taliban, the fighting folks, try to think about that. Where's your leadership? What are they doing? And so I, I, think the, I think the Afghan security forces, as we move into 15, will continue to do well. But I do believe that the people have to continue to r rise up against us, not support them. And we see many places throughout the country where you have these anti-Taliban movements continue to spring up, where the people are fed up with the Taliban. They know that the message they have does not resonate, especially with the new unity government as you move forward. Is ISIL having any influence here? Yeah, there's been some talk lately on some recruiting for ISIL, but you know, I have not seen any military uh, information or intelligence that shows that ISIL has taken any kind of hold in, inside of Afghanistan. We'll continue to watch that. I know the president's concerned about that as well, uh, but I have not seen that yet. When we talk about resolute support, what will be the U.S. force's role? Well, again, a resolute support, to what we'll continue to do is train, advise, and assist at the core and ministry level. There'll also be a counter-terrorist piece that will continue to work that we've done for the last 13 years. We continue to build the capacity of the Afghan security forces and the special operating forces for the Afghans and their capability This that I've seen this time around is, is incredible. They have the equipment, the training, and the people that far surpass anywhere else in this region of the world that I've seen. The ability for them to take helicopters and fly them at night, limited visibility, put them in the small drop, zone, drop zones or LZs is phenomenal. They have their own ISR capability out there as well. And so uh, we'll continue to work on that piece of it. I think they're very proud of that fact. Uh, they take pride that they have a very good, uh, good force there. The Afghan people, you know, in all the surveys we do, they've rated the Afghan security forces as the number one institution in all of Afghanistan. So that trust and confidence continues to build in the, entirely in the Afghan security forces. And now with the message that the presence brought on with the Afghan security forces and embracing them and going to be the commander in chief and some of the things that he'll do with them by allowing them to have policies that maybe President Karzai didn't let them do, uh, where he may have let detainees go, the president's been very stern. If you've, uh, if you've killed, you've injured, you've attacked Afghan security forces, you will not be released. You know, so that resonates with the Afghan security forces, and that resonates with the people of Afghanistan. Do we have a sense yet of what the enduring footprint will look like? I mean, which installations, which bases will stay? When I was here in 2010, 2011, we probably had, you know, upwards three or four, 500 different little small outposts out there and bigger fobs. Today, we're less than 30. And so we've turned over many of those uh, to the Afghans, and we've closed many of them in concert with them, which ones they needed, which ones they didn't need. And we're going to go to really a spoken hub concept. So in the south, you're going to be down in Kandahar. In the west, you're going to be in Herat. In the north, in Mazar Sharif. And out in the east, we'll be in Jalalabad and Gambari, Bagram, and then Kabul centric. So that's really going to be our footprint as we move forward. You know, when I used to do battlefield circulation, I'd go to, you know, hour and a half north to my one post in RCs, hour and a half south on a helicopter to another one. And it, I'd visit four or five each day, and it'd take me two months to get to every one I had to go to now. You know, there's just not that many places that we have U.S. forces and or uh, the coalition forces out there. And so that footprint continues to come down. What we're working very hard on, we have de-scoped many of the places that we were going to put stuff in. And as we've downsized our footprint, we said we don't need that now. So we've gone back and done a really holistic scrub on all of our facilities, all the contracts are out there. I think we've also worked very hard as we provide uh, money to the Afghans, both on the MOI and MOD, that we put in some clauses in these uh, commitment letters that I signed to them that lays out very specifically, you have to do this in order to get this money, you got to do this in order to get that. So 
we're really trying to work hard to help President Ghani as he goes after really the corruption. In the past, we may not have had some of those levers and controls and leverage it to our, our best use here. And we're going to do that as we move forward because we absolutely understand that the money, we have to be held accountable and the Afghans have to be held accountable. As part of the Resolute Support, we're really looking at eight essential functions that we go after. One of the areas is really on, on transparency, accountability, and oversight. So we're really looking at that in all the ministries and work that very hard. So you think it's possible that we can actually get rid of corruption? Well, I mean, corruption has been around for years and years. I think that uh, everybody's been working at it very hard. There's probably going to be a certain amount of corruption no matter what we do, but uh, with the work of President Ghani, with the work of the international community, I think we'll really get after those big pieces of corruption. In the past, uh, you know, it, it couldn't be something just that the coalition wanted. The government had to want this as well. And that's the difference again. This is a new Afghanistan as we move forward. And President Ghani and, the, and, and what he's put in motion about going after corruption, he's looking at putting people in positions of responsibility based on their merit. Uh, and their ability as opposed to the patronage network of just putting somebody in there because he was the brother or the cousin. And so uh, with his help and with his focus on corruption, we're absolutely going to complement that. Sir, you paint a very positive picture, but this is Afghanistan. Nothing is simple. What's your struggle? <laughs> well, believe me, I've been, you know, this is my third time here. Uh, probably been in Afghanistan 40 or 50 times for visits over the last, you know, 13 years. Afghanistan's very, very tough. People have to understand that where they were and where they are today. When I have visiting Codells or Staffdells or Senators, or I had a couple folks from uh, European think tanks that came through the other day, I show them a couple different slides. One is, you know, why we're here, and I show pictures of Madrid bombing, I show pictures of the Twin Towers. Then I show pictures of where, where they've come, and a picture of Kabul in 2001, uh, of a circle there and all the devastation, and where we are in 2014 and the traffic show pictures of the young kids, especially the females that are in school now learning. And then we show some statistics about just, you know, things that we take for granted, cell phone usage, towers that are out there, roads that are open, schools and the millions of people that go to school now. And so the difference from 2001 to 2014 is huge. You know, you know, we shouldn't make light of that. We don't get a lot of visibility on that. You know, again, good news doesn't, uh, doesn't make the news, quite frankly. But those are things that the Afghan people see and they're very appreciative of that and we'll continue to move forward on that. But Again, this is, a, this is a nation that's been at war for 35 plus years and will continue to have some sort of security issue as we move forward for the next several years. And so to think that this will change overnight or just because there's a new government or we continue to downsize, it's going to take continued investment by people working you know, hand in hand, Shona by Shona with the Afghans. But they want this. You know, we, we've always struggled and said they have to want this more than we do. And I absolutely see that they do. Uh, where we're getting some traction now, quite frankly, is between Iraq, Syria, don't let Afghanistan fall into what Iraq is. And for just a very small investment as we continue to move forward, I feel with the government, with the Afghan security forces, we can do that. And the position that Afghanistan's in to really be an anchor in this part of the world of stability is huge. Simple thing that I tell people that, you know, I think resonates. Since we've had people on the ground here, there hadn't been another 9-11 attack in the U.S. And that's not because people haven't been trying to attack us. Uh, that's because we've had men and women, great men and women, for deploy that have sacrificed a great deal to be out here. And they've disrupted uh, many of the insurgents that would use this place as a sanctuary to do that. I, I think we've got to look at those kind of things as we move forward. We've got to feel that Afghanistan can be a success, is a success. It's going to have some difficulties and challenges. We shouldn't you know, paint that rosy of a picture. But a guy that's been on the ground several times working with the Afghans to see how much they really want it, you know, I feel, very, I feel very good about where we're going in the future. I'm very passionate about this. I'm dedicated to where Afghanistan is going to be in the future. Uh, for many of the folks that have, are over here on the staff, you've seen there are two, three, four, five times back there. So we're all personally invested in this. And we want to see uh, that the sacrifice we've had over the years pays off in the end. My son's in the Army. He's a sergeant. He's been here twice. He just left. So my family's dedicated to this. But that, that's, I'm not alone. Uh, all the men and women you meet here, many here multiple times over the last 13 years, have met, have worked with, have friends with the Afghans and the security forces. They understand you know, what they kind of want as they move forward. They're very uh, compassionate people here. They want the same things that we want. They want a roof over their heads. They want to be able to provide for their kids. They want the kids to go to school. Uh, they want a job. We're, we're, we're dedicated to helping out the Afghans here and, and having to spend 12, 18, you know, three years of your life here um, I think will be worth it down the road. And the Afghans, again, I think are very appreciative of that. 
That's not the message you got underneath President Carr's eye. Believe me, we all understand that. And some of the frustration to get out of here very quick now may be because of that. But, you know, I say we need some patience as we go forward. We got the new Afghanistan here. We got to take advantage of this and leverage it in these relationships. We, the United States, our allies, we have 13 years invested in Afghanistan. That's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. As you look around at your level, is the payoff worth it? Are we going to be satisfied with the outcome? I, I think if you look at it now, for me, and again, I've been, you know, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of memorials here, so I, I don't take that lightly about the sacrifice of our fallen, of our wounded, and I have to be able to look a family member in the eyes and say, hey, I believe that your, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, you know, did not die in vain, that his sacrifice was worth it, and I, and I truly believe that. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. But I also think that not only in Afghanistan, but in the world we live in today, you know, this, this, this terrorist piece, this is a, this is going to be, this is a generational thing. It's going to be here for years and years. And so we should not think that, hey, now that we come out of Afghanistan, that all is going to be hunky-dory throughout the world. I think a good thing, again, as I alluded to earlier, that there hadn't been another 9-11, that the people back in the United States don't have to worry about what's going on over here. Their biggest inconvenience is going to the airport, you know, and, and getting searched because of what happened here 13 years ago. But that's it. And, and that's probably a good thing. We shouldn't take light of this great sacrifice here. I don't. The, the men and women here don't. Every Sunday, we go out right in front of the headquarters. We've got two memorials out there, and we, uh, we take some time to remember the sacrifices of both the Afghans and the martyrs. We also have on the, on the U.S. and the coalition. And we think about what the last 13 years has meant, and that's pretty special. Do you get a sense that the international community will stay committed, that they see the need here as you see it? Yeah, you know, again, if you're on the ground here, it's different from, you know, 4,000 miles away and, and all you're getting from the media is that the, the Taliban continue to win or they've, they've beheaded people here. You know, they don't see the schools, they don't see the kids' faces, they don't see the Afghan that goes out there and is protecting the people of Afghanistan. So we have to continue to, to be much better at getting that message out. And the Afghans, quite frankly, have to be much better at getting that message out. And underneath President Karzai, they were afraid to do that. And I think you'll see both on the military side and on the civilian side, they'll start getting the message out that, hey, we are Afghanistan, we're a sovereign country, we can take care of ourselves, but we still need a little bit of help from the international community. And we'll get there and we'll continue to work there. There is talk back in the U.S. about you know, the U.S. people are tired of this. They're tired of war. Uh, they're tired of the sacrifice. I don't get that feeling when I go talk to the U.S. people. The feeling I get is, hey, we support our military, we support what you're doing over there. We thank you for the hope that you give to Afghanistan. And again, this is a, as we move forward, as we come out of the ISAF mission, go into resident support, it's going to be a very small investment, particularly for the U.S. side, less than 10,000 boots on the ground. For that, we can continue to invest with the Afghans and make this part of the world much, much safer. Give me a, a message, sir, something that I can take back with me to our audience. Our most important legacy really will probably be the things that we leave behind as far as the processes and the systems and the opportunities that we provide the Afghans. What I tell the men and women that come over here and serve, you know, sometimes you're really too close to it and you can't understand the impact that you've had, uh, but you provided hope to the Afghans, and that's a big deal. You walk the streets of Kabul or drive the streets, you see the, the shops that are open, you see the schools, and you see the kids going back and forth, and the hope that they have for the future. That's really what we've provided, I think, to the Afghans, their future. We've uh, all seen uh, many that paid the ultimate sacrifice. We've all seen those who have come back to the U.S. wounded uh, and will have very difficult lives as they move forward. And I want to thank them and their, their families for their continued sacrifice. But I want them to understand that uh, what they've done does mean a great deal to the Afghan people. And uh, we need to continue to thank them for it. And the Afghan people, both the senior leadership, people on the streets, they always come up there. And the first thing they tell me is thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for what uh, you've done and the sacrifices. You know, we ought to feel very good about that.